know, so we just have to regroup. Like I said, next season starts right now, and uh, you know, come back next season and play. How much harder will you work in this offseason now to get back to the championship? I'll push myself to exhaustion. Yeah. Now, well, one of the things I recommend to young people, especially true for people in their 20s, is that you should push yourself beyond your limits of tolerance in your 20s to find out where it is. How much can you work? How disciplined can you become? Like, can you work 12 hours a day? Can you work eight hours a day? Can you work three hours a day? Like, flat out. Where's your limit? And how much, how much work can you do and how much socialization? You should find out. Push yourself past and then back off to, to that point where it's optimally sustainable. It's good to think about that as a goal. It's like you're trying to discover what your limitations are when you're, when you're in your 20s so that you can hit that edge, so that you can sustain yourself across the decades. And so, yeah, because you don't, you don't want to have too much fun, right? Too much fun takes you out. You don't want to be the oldest guy at the disco, you know? It's not, it's not fun being the 40-year-old at the singles bar, precisely. So you want to make sure that what you're doing is age appropriate and you want to push yourself in every direction that you can, but you should be doing that with an aim in mind. It's like you're trying to make yourself into a better and more competent person. And so some discipline along with the fun is a good idea. No, it, you're, you're, you're out running the track, working out, and you start talking to yourself saying, man, my, my knee is really sore right now. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm doing too much. Maybe I need to back off, you know? <laughs> Man, my lungs are burning. Am I, maybe I can just slow down here. I'll do like an extra two sets tomorrow. You know, it'll be okay. Yeah. Right? That sort of stuff. Yes. Like that stuff's dangerous. Yes. And that's, you just got to say, you know what? I'm not negotiating with this. Yeah. The deal was already made. The deal was made. When I set out at the beginning of the summer and said, this is the training plan I'm doing. I signed that contract with myself. I'm doing it. You know, throughout the, that process, you'll start talking to yourself like, man, I gotta, I think I need to, maybe if we, nope, <laughs> no, this is not negotiable. Not negotiable. Yeah. The bike got easier. I was able to run more. I went from like one mile, one mile was a great accomplishment, two miles, and then from two to three was a big one. Then I went from three to six. And then, like, they have a warning order that they give people to get ready for buds. And the whole thing was running six miles, five days a week. And that was my goal. And so I just kept, I failed, I go back to scratch. I use some positive motivation. I have like one day where I'm like fucking defeated. But I started realizing this is part of the process. This is part of the journey. I had to realize this is part of my process versus just saying, like I used to, I'm just not good enough. If I'm not good enough, we always say that shit. I'm just not good enough and then we try something else. I'm gonna fucking make myself good enough. And that became my mentality. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make myself good enough. And so I misunderstood a lot, but that's, that's all it came down to. I made myself good enough. And the days I couldn't run that far, the next week, I would do two a days. So I, on the running, if I ran a quarter of a mile, I wait a fucking couple hours, it haunt me, bother me. I try to run a half a mile the next time, same day. You, you can do more than this. If I had to walk, I had to walk. It just became just a process of, grinding and grinding and grinding is not even a good word for it it's not even a good word for it and just just going further and further and then when i got through running i go to the bike i go to the pool if i got tired somewhere my legs were tired i, I go to the gym and i developed this crazy workout where i was doing volume like two three hundred reps of like very lightweight people i say you know how come you don't have any like loose skin my workout routine in the gym became sick um but I remember we were playing against the Lakers, though, and we were out here in L.A. And, uh, you know, like, I always try to outwork people, right? That's just how I made my mark. So the game was at 7. It's like, you know what? I'm going to come to the Staples Center. Because we are playing this when the Lakers had Kobe and Shaq, okay? This is, this is like the championship Lakers. So, you know, I'm going to get there at 3 o'clock. I want to make sure I make 400 made shots before I go back into the room. And then I sit in the zone and I get ready for the game. So, you know, get in the car get to the gym, get there. And as I'm walking onto the court, who do I see? I see Kobe Bryant, already working out. And I'm like, okay, it's kind of cool. It's Kobe, what's up Kobe, you know? And uh, you know, so I put my sneakers on and you ever get lost in what you do where you end up, wait, it's been an hour and a half. I got, I'm just, I'm, I'm here, I'm in it. So once I set my foot across that line, I started working out. And so I worked out for a good hour, hour and a half. And when I came off after I was done, I sat down 
And of course, I still heard the ball bounce. I look down, I'm like, this guy's guy still working out. He was working out. Like, it looks like he was in a dead sweat when I got here. And he's still going. And it's not like his moves are nonchalant, or lazy. <laughs> he's doing like game moves, you know? Um, I sit there and I unlace my shoes. I'm like, I want to see how long this goes. So I sit out there and watch another 25 minutes. And he got done. I said, okay, I think I've seen enough. Go play, you know, come back, get in the sauna, get ready for the game. That game, he drops 40 on us, okay? And after the game is over, I'm like, I, I have to ask this guy. Like, I, I have to understand, like, why why he, he works like that. Right. So after the game, I'm like, hey, Kobe, like, why why were you in the gym for so long? He's like, because I saw you come in. <laughs> and, I, and I wanted you to know that it doesn't matter how hard you work, that I'm willing to work harder than you. Wow. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved, through faith, not, not that not of yourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you could work your way to heaven and pay your way to heaven, you'd get up and say, look what I did. I got myself here by my own good works. The only way you're ever going to make it is to come to that cross where Christ took our sins and our judgment and our hell and identify ourselves with him. And then there are some people that say, well, I'll reform, I'll do better. I know people that are always saying, I'm going to do better, but they never do better. They don't have any power within them to do better until they come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, an explosion takes place of power that he gives you to live a new life. I can't live the Christian life. I have no power within me to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit has to live in me and Christ has to live through me. I cannot live the Christian life. I'm a total flop and failure. So what I want you to know today is that Jesus loves you. He loves you just the way that you are. He's not going to love you more when you think that you can break your addiction of pornography. He's not going to think of you more or more precious if you do good and give. Or if you pray to Him longer. Or if you have the gift that everybody else has, he's certainly going to hear me more. He's certainly going to love me more. No, I'm sorry. He does it because he loves us all the same. How can a father love a child differently than another child? Can you hear an amen? I've seen demons. I've seen exorcisms. I've seen all this. But let me tell you this. If you come to Jesus Christ, you say to the lies, who's the devil, to say, talk to the foot, because the ears ain't listening. You want to know why God gave me a foot? Because the devil's my footstool. You want to know why God gave me a heel? Because with my heel, I crush the snake's head. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Few, he said, only a few are going to find it. that narrow gate and that narrow way, as I said last evening. Are you among that few? You not only choose between two ways of life, but you choose between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism, he says, in Matthew the sixth chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. You have to make a choice. All the way through the Bible, choices, 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 choices. If your house is broken and there's a carpenter willing to help you fix what you can't fix, how do you expect him to fix your broken home until you let him in? Don't let Jesus Christ into your life as a guest in your house. Because when the devil comes knocking, the guest never opens the door. The owner does. The Bible says this very clearly. Ready? This is it. Last thing. Ready? If you hold on to your life, you will lose your life. If you give up your life, you will have your life saved. Jesus, here's the key. This is much bigger than me. Come into my life. 
I want your plan, not my plan. I want your strength, not my strength. It's time. And we want you to know at this church that everyone is welcome, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no shame, there is no guilt, and your past is left behind. Not only does God forgive you of all of your sins, but He says in the Word, He has forgotten them. So from this day on, when you hear, hey, do you remember, blah, blah, blah? That's the freaking devil. And you say, get behind me. I am not forsaken. I am a new creation. What's past is past. And what God helps me to move forward. Sorry, I said freaking. You move forward into all that God has for you. Amen. God has come to give you new life and new life more abundant we want you to not only between two ways of life and two masters but you're going to have to choose between two fathers two spiritual fathers he said in john 8 a very shocking statement the 44th verse he said you are of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do now he says for many of you the devil is your spiritual father now, you're not aware of it. You wouldn't admit it. But that's the way God looks at it. There's either God, your spiritual father, the true and the living God, Christ, or there is the devil. And then you have to choose not only between two ways of life and two masters and two fathers, but you have to choose between two destinies, heaven or hell. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7, 27. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, he taught at both universities, used to emphasize, he said, no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with more clarity and authority as Jesus Christ. And one of the most played pop songs is the Led Zeppelin Stairway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. He is the way to heaven. Come to him. I want to live forever and ever and ever where there is no evil, where there is no sickness, no disease, no death, no fear, no sadness, no sorrow, no depression, no addictions, no afflictions, no oppression, no slavery, no worries at all. Living forevermore without the devil himself. The same devil who is the serpent in the Garden of Eden. The same devil that's going around the world like a roaring lion seeking who to destroy, kill, and devour. That guy, that devil, ain't going to be in heaven. So I want you to know that when you fix your eyes on Jesus, you now start to believe in heaven and when you now start to believe in heaven you can have a faith that goes even beyond death that goes even beyond your physical circumstance and I want you to know that God is with you and he loves you and you can't do anything with your broken pieces you can't even sometimes forgive yourself but when you give God your broken pieces he does amazing things Ephesians 3.20 describes God as the God who can do and will do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever ask, imagine, or attain. What a wonderful thing to go to bed tonight and know that the past is gone, forgiven, cleansed, and God no longer remembers your sins. Yes, and this choice is very urgent. To delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision is itself a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. Choose now. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise a tomorrow. Come while you can. Time itself makes the decision for you if you don't. You say, but what do I have to do? Three things. You must be willing to repent of your sin. That means to change your way of thinking about your sins and realize how bad they are in the sight of God. Change your way your thinking about God and say, I love him and I'm going to love him with all my heart, mind and soul. I'm going to make him the priority of my life. I'm going to put him first from now on. He's going to be not only my savior, but my law. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. You may be a officer in the church 
but you're not sure about your relationship with Christ and you want to be sure, and you must be willing to repent. And secondly, by faith, receive Christ into your heart. That means you put your whole weight on him and trust him and him alone. And thirdly, you follow and serve him as his disciple and follower and obey him. That means a big change for many of you if you make this choice. I'm going to ask you to make it now. And I'm going to ask you to do it publicly as we've seen thousands of people this week already come to Christ. I'm going to ask you to get up from your seat. If you start from that top stand up there, it'll take you two minutes. So start now and come and stand in front of this platform. And as you all stand here in front of the platform, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature and you can go back and join your friends. You're making that choice by coming and standing here. And the reason I do it publicly is because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. Joshua called upon the people publicly. Moses called upon the people publicly to inscribe their commitment that would be seen publicly for generations to come. I'm asking you tonight to publicly and openly come and say tonight, Christ is going to be priority in my life. I want to know that I have eternal life. If you know that you do not have an active relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to lead you into a prayer that begins your active relationship with him. I don't care how old you are, and I don't care how young you are or young you feel. If you know that you're a sinner and you want to believe that Jesus loves you and has a plan for you, he'll transform your life. He is here to redeem you and restore your soul. He is here to bring you back to joy, to peace and rest. Will you tonight make your life right with him?